fifth grade. Um, I miss all of your faces already, uh, but I'm looking forward to seeing you all in class this week. Hopefully you'll be on Zoom and we can actually chat then. Um, but for now, I'm just gonna go through some of the notes with you. These come from your cells and tissues packet, um, which you should have at home, hopefully. Um, and we were a little ways into this. So this is what it should look like on the front. Um, we have gone through uh, the microscope stuff. And we are now working on this part about eukaryotic cells. Now I think some of us had um, maybe already started this, but I wanna go ahead and just start here so that everybody can be um, on the same page and we can um, review if we need to review a little. So if you've already done this, then you can just listen along, but if you haven't, go ahead and start taking notes here. This is what we're gonna do from now on. I'm gonna post a video where I take notes with you and then, um, I'll also post some other videos where I just explain and draw um, things that might be helpful. So here we go. Plant and animal cells. Are you karyotic? They are usually larger than the type of cell that we already talked about. So the type of cell we already talked about were, um, those were bacterial cells. And so they're usually larger than bacterial cells and they have more structures inside of them. So many of these structures have membranes that are not attached to the actual cell membrane. So if you remember last time we learned about um, certain structures that are in every cell, and one of those was the cell membrane, and that's what goes around and surrounds the cell, actually makes it a cell. These little structures um, have membranes that are not attached to that membrane. And these structures, we give them um, what I think is a really cute little name. We call them organelles. So this comes from two different root words if we want to take the same root as organ, which in your body you have organs, right? You could probably think of an organ right now. Heart, lungs, brain, your skin is a really big weird organ, um, your stomach, and each of those things has a specific function that it does to help your body work. Um, your heart pumps your blood, your lungs help you absorb oxygen, your stomach helps you digest your food. So each organ has a specific function. And if we put this little L ending on it, um, what that does is that is a French ending for tiny or small. So inside cells, which are we need a microscope to see, they have tiny, tiny little organs that we would call organelles, which are just little structures that do specific functions. So they do specific functions inside of cells, just like your organs do special functions in your body. So that's kind of cool. Cells have little miniature organs. I um, mean, we're gonna talk about some of those organs today. So first, we're gonna start with structures that are found in all types of eukaryotic cells. So there are two kinds of eukaryotic cells. There are plant and animal cells. Um, and so we're gonna talk about structures that are found in both plants and animals. So just like bacterial cells, we also have a few things in common with bacteria. Um, plant and animal cells have cell membranes. So we get to have cell membranes just like bacteria do. Plants also have cell membranes. We have chromosomes. Chromosomes, remember, are made out of DNA. And if we didn't have chromosomes, we wouldn't have any instructions for our body. So our cells wouldn't know what to do or what to make or anything. It would be impossible to exist. So chromosomes, we usually have more than one, but bacteria just have one. So humans actually have 46 chromosomes um, and bacteria tend to have one. Um, so it, 
takes a little bit more information to make something as complex as a human, which is one of the reasons why we have more uh, chromosomes. And we also have ribosomes. So if you remember before we were on break, um, we talked about how ribosomes make proteins um, and so most of your body is made out of proteins the chemical reactions in your body require proteins so in order for you to function you need proteins so we need ribosomes to make those proteins so eukaryotic cells also have this is a mistake sorry just cross that blank out eukaryotic cells also have all of these organelles So the first of these we're going to talk about is the nucleus. And in animal cells, this is usually the largest structure. It's usually the second largest in plants. Um, we'll talk about the thing that's actually the largest in plants when we get to that in a little bit. The chromosomes get stored in the nucleus. And they're located only for eukaryotes because prokaryotes or bacterial cells don't have a nucleus. So their chromosomes just float around in their cytoplasm. But for us, plant and animal cells, um, we have all eukaryotes have a nucleus and the chromosomes go in that nucleus. And because the chromosomes are in there, we usually view the nucleus as kind of like a control center of the cell it controls everything else that's going on in the cell. The endoplasmic reticulum is the next structure we're going to talk about. This structure often has ribosomes attached. So remember, I was just talking about earlier what ribosomes do, they're gonna make proteins. And um, the endoplasmic reticulum has a function that has to do with proteins. So the ribosomes are gonna be attached to part of it. For the part that does have ribosomes attached, that is called rough because if we look at it under an electron microscope, the surface of the electron or of the endoplasmic reticulum, we can see ribosomes. Oh, and you know what? I better scoot up so you guys can see me, huh? That would be helpful, Mrs. Garvalo. I could hear you guys all yelling at me through the computer. Isn't that amazing? So the endoplasmic reticulum, if we were to zoom in on a little section of it, the rough endoplasmic reticulum would look like this. It has ribosomes attached to it, and so it looks bumpy when we look at it under an electron microscope. The part that does not have electron or does not have ribosomes on it looks really smooth. And so we call that the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. So in every type of cell, there's going to be two kinds of endoplasmic reticulum. The rough is going to have ribosomes attached and the smooth will not. The endoplasmic reticulum is going to modify proteins. So basically, uh, proteins come out and they're not quite ready to go. They've got to get fixed up. And so the endoplasmic reticulum is going to fix up those proteins and it's going to put them in a tiny little bubble of membrane so if you imagine something that looks like this, and then inside we've got all of our little proteins. This would be called a vesicle. It's just a membrane package. And it's going to send them to our next organelle, which is gonna be called the Golgi apparatus. Um, we'll talk about the Golgi apparatus more on the next page. By the way, if you want to read a little bit more about these uh, organelles and things that they do or you see some pictures, a good place to do that is either you can look on the um, activities that I posted under enrichment activities, or if you want to, if you brought your science source home and you want to read pages 76 to 77, those should have all of the organelles for both plant and animal cells. 
So to the Golgi apparatus. Now first, something a little bit annoying. I did not do this, it's not my fault, so you have to blame someone else. But there are several names for the Golgi apparatus. It can also be called the Golgi, ooh, look what happened there. My letters got out of order. It can also be called the Golgi body. Or the Golgi complex. Oh my goodness, guys, what is going on today? Okay, the Golgi complex. If you see anything with Golgi after it in the context of the cell, it's going to be the same thing. So Golgi apparatus, Golgi body, Golgi complex, those are all exactly the same thing. Um, this structure further, so it's going to do the same job as the endoplasmic reticulum, just a little bit more. So it further modifies proteins and it produces vesicles marked with chemical tags. And those chemical tags tell the cell where that vesicle package should go. So the chemical tags here are gonna be kind of like an address label. So let's imagine you wanna send a letter to your grandma. You can't just write grandma on the thing and then the postman magically knows where that is, right? You have to get a tag and you have to actually put on that tag your grandma's name, the address, the zip code, all of those things that are gonna help somebody know where the letter goes. Um, and so this the same thing happens with vesicle packages in your body. They get a little chemical tag that gets stuck on the outside of the vesicle and your cells can interpret that and decide where the vesicle should go. Um, sometimes the vesicle will dump its contents outside of the cell. And it does this by fusing with the cell membrane. One example of this is there's an enzyme in your saliva that helps you digest things like crackers. Um, if you've never tried this experiment, you should. You could go get a cracker. So you can pause me right now. Isn't this cool? You can't pause me in regular class. But you could pause me. You can go get a cracker. Ready? Did you do it? Okay. So if you did, you can put that cracker in your mouth and you can start chewing it. Yep. That's right. I'm waiting. And if you hold on for a second, you'll notice after you chew the cracker that it starts to get a little bit sweet in your mouth. That's weird, right? When you first put a cracker in your mouth, it's kind of salty and starchy. But if you wait, you can actually taste it get a little bit sweet. And that's because you have this enzyme in your saliva, which is a type of protein, and it's going to um, help you digest starches in your, into sugars in your mouth. Um, and so this enzyme in saliva has to get into your mouth or into your spit in a certain way. Um, and the way that it does that um, is it gets from, it goes from your salivary gland into your mouth. And the way it does that, I think, is really fun. So I'm going to show you guys a quick drawing of how that happens. So here's a little drawing I made. If you want to copy this into your notes, you can pause it again here and copy these down. But inside of your salivary gland, we have your Golgi complex, okay? Um, or your Golgi body, Golgi apparatus, whatever you want to call it. And the Golgi complex actually looks like a stack of pancakes, but it bubbles off little bits of its membrane to make these vesicle packages. Now these vesicle packages go ahead and they float up toward the, and they actually, they don't float, float isn't quite correct. They travel along um, little tubes in your cell and they are eventually gonna get carried to where they join, they run into or bump into the cell membrane. And because this is made out of a membrane and this is made out of a membrane, when it bumps into the cell membrane, it actually becomes part of the cell membrane. And what happens is when this becomes part of the cell membrane, the vesicle now has popped open. And the things that were inside of the little vesicle bubble are free to go out into the outside world. In the case of the salivary gland, this part right here, this would be your mouth. 
So next time you think about that, next time you're chewing something, this is happening. A bunch of these tiny little bubbles are coming up to the surface of your cell and pop, they open up. It's pretty cool. So that's the job of the Golgi apparatus. The mitochondrion, let's talk about this guy. Um, the mitochondrion looks like this. Draw yourself a little bean shape and draw a curvy inner membrane. By the way, we're gonna do more review with each of these organelles and we're gonna go over a picture of the cell where I'll point out each of these structures to you. But that'll be a different lecture. So here you have your mitochondrion, okay? This structure is where your cells exchange sugar. So, um, and not just sugar, but we're gonna use sugar as an example. Obviously, hopefully anyway, you eat things other than sugar and your body can process those too. Um, but um, for sugar, that's the easiest thing to think about, like glucose. Um, it's going to take that sugar and exchange it for smaller, sorry, this should say energy. It's gonna exchange sugar energy for smaller packets of chemical energy called ATP. Now, if you're a curious kid and you wanna know what ATP stands for, I'll tell you. This isn't going to be on any test, so if this freaks you out and you're like, whoa, Mrs. Carvalho, bless you, what did you say? It sounded like you sneezed. Um, you don't have to worry about remembering this, but this is called adenosine triphosphate. There you go, so ATP. Um, ATP is the energy that your cells can actually use. So your cells can't use sugar, it's too big, um, it's not very efficient, they don't have a good way of working with it. So in order for your cells to have energy, um, they have to take all the food that you eat and they have to convert the energy from the food into ATP. So cells that use a lot of energy, like a muscle cell would be a good example. They use lots of energy for moving you around. And they have many mitochondria because they need lots of ATP. One note about this, mitochondrion is a singular mitochondrion. And if you have more than one, we call them mitochondria. Um, so mitochondria um, are gonna convert your glucose into ATP. A good way of thinking of that is let's say your parents take you on a super cool trip. Um, you're gonna go to Japan, okay? When you get to Japan, you won't be able to spend your English dollars in the stores. What you'll have to do is you'll have to take your dollars and you'll have to exchange some of them for Japanese yen. And once you get there, um, you will you be able to use it once you exchange it. The same thing has to happen in your body. You eat all of this energy in the form of food, but your body can't use it. So in order to use it, we have to um, convert it into something usable. And the thing that that is, is called ATP. All right, we're gonna stop here for today. I'll put the organelles and plant cells into a different lecture. Um, and then I'm also gonna go back over these a couple of times and you'll get another lecture on the two cells at the back where we will um, color them together and I'll tell you what all the parts look like. All right, have a good day.